The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but only endures for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God, Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So our story from Genesis this morning begins with Rebecca, the wife of Isaac, finally conceiving after many years of struggling with infertility. She becomes pregnant with twins, and it is not an easy pregnancy for her. I can relate a bit to Rebecca here. I was fortunate that my own twin pregnancy a few years ago was uncomplicated and I was able to avoid things like bed rest and early delivery. But I still know how physically taxing it is to carry two babies inside you, especially by the end. That's a lot of a baby and the weight of it can feel like it's tearing you apart, everything hurts, and your belly is full of constant movement. I never felt like my two were fighting, but they were definitely active, especially Daniel, who was right up front and easy to feel and never stopped kicking. Imagine that. (laughs) For Rebecca, it all gets to be too much. She is worn out and frazzled by carrying these boys, and to her it feels like the babies are constantly fighting and struggling with each other. She goes to the temple to pray to God about it, and God responds with an oracle that interprets what she's feeling, giving her an insight into what the future will likely hold for her sons. It's not just two brothers she is carrying, but the fathers of two nations that will be divided. And contrary to the normal way of things in that time and place, the older child will not be the dominant one, but the younger, something that was almost bound to cause conflict. And conflict does seem to dominate this family. The boys are not born with that famed twin bond that some multiples share. Instead, the one they named Jacob is born holding on to the heel of the first twin, Esau, as if even in the womb he were trying to be first, to take Esau's place. Jacob and Esau have very different personalities, so they aren't naturally drawn together. And the parents don't help. They have clear favorites between the boys. This hasn't been my experience, but some of my friends who are moms of twins talk about the kids having preferred parents, like the one twin always wants mom and the other always wants dad. But in the situation of Isaac and Rebecca, they're the ones with the favorites. Isaac loves Esau best and Rebecca loves Jacob. Maybe Isaac saw himself more in Esau. Maybe he favored him because he was the firstborn and stood to be Isaac's primary heir although it's hard to make much of a case for being the eldest when it's only by minutes. And Rebecca, maybe she doted on Jacob because of the oracle that she had received from God. 
feeling like Jacob was God's preferred boy. Whatever the seeds of the conflict were, it's clear that from early on, Jacob resents Esau's place in the family. He wants Esau's position, his inheritance. He wants God's blessing. Doubtless, his parents had told him of God's promises to Abraham, passed on to Isaac. Jacob wants to be next in line, to live within the sphere of God's blessing. And so, on two separate occasions that the Bible tells us of, he schemes to make sure that he gets it. We heard this morning about the first time. Jacob is cooking a lentil stew when Esau comes in starving from working in the field. He asks Jacob for some stew, and Jacob sees an opportunity. He tells Esau that the price of the meal is Esau's birthright, his right to be the primary heir, inheriting two-thirds of his father's possessions. Esau is unable to look further than his growling stomach and agrees. Neither brother comes off looking good in this story. Esau is foolish and short-sighted, a slave to his physical desires. Jacob is greedy and conniving, perfectly willing to take advantage of his brother. The next episode takes place a little later. Esau has married two local women who we are told make life bitter for his parents. Isaac is now old, unable to see and close to death. He asks Esau to hunt for him and to prepare some food, after which he will give him his blessing before he dies. Rebecca overhears and she concocts a plan where Jacob will dress up as Esau and bring Isaac some food, taking the blessing for himself before Esau can return. Jacob agrees, and though Isaac seems to have his suspicions, things go according to Rebekah and Jacob's plans. Isaac gives Jacob his blessing. When Esau returns and finds what has happened, he is heartbroken. Bless me, me also, father. He pleads with Isaac, weeping. Isaac does give him a blessing of sorts, but not the blessing of the firstborn, not the blessing that belonged to him. Esau is filled with rage. He had to have been hurt by his mother's actions, and he is furious with Jacob, who has now conned him out of his birthright and his blessing, stolen them both as Esau sees it. He plots to kill his brother, and Jacob is forced to flee, which is where our story next week picks up. This family is a mess. The people in this family are a mess. They are not paragons of virtue by any means. They wound each other deeply again and again, as deeply as only those who love each other most can. We know that from our relationships in our own families, our friendships, right? All of us have messy, broken relationships. Our families are functional and dysfunctional on different levels, without a doubt. And some of us bear fewer scars than others. But we all know the difficulty and the wounds and the messiness of broken human beings trying to be in intimate relationship with one another. I had a professor in seminary who told us that in ministry, you realize quickly how thin the veneer of civilization is. In church, we try to show our best faces. We often hide our struggles or what we consider our dirty secrets. But this room is full of people carrying pain and trouble that we may know nothing about. In our families, we may have had the experience of feeling like a parent favored a brother or a sister over us. We may have felt that we had to earn a parent's love. Maybe there is conflict with our siblings. Maybe our grown child has cut us out of their lives. Maybe there is emotional or physical abuse. We may be dealing with someone battling addiction. Maybe our family has been pulled into the criminal justice system when someone was incarcerated. Maybe we've been hurt by betrayal or divorce. Or maybe there are the more ordinary troubles of sharp words spoken in anger, breakdowns in communication, stress taking its toll. We all know brokenness in ourselves and in our deepest relationships, but we don't know what to do with it. We feel like we have to hide it. 
As Christians, we can at times imagine that it somehow disqualifies us from being part of God's family. We forget that throughout the Bible, God is constantly choosing and blessing these really messed up people and their families. It's not that God chooses or desires our wounds and the pain that comes with them. Those issues that I named a minute ago, they can leave people saddled with grief, resentment, jealousy, anger, insecurity. They can literally cut lives short. And God grieves for the pain that we bear and the way that our wounds can keep us from living the abundant life that God intends. And yet being broken does not disqualify us from that abundant life. Often it is at our most broken that we are able to experience God most deeply. I recently read a book by Anne Voskamp called The Broken Way, A Daring Path into the Abundant Life. Voskamp re reveals her own struggles with anxiety, depression, insecurity, the broken places in her own family. But she recounts as well how she is coming to understand being broken not as a stumbling block to living God's abundant life, but as the path toward it. Early on in the book, she shares something her husband said to her as she struggled. She writes, you know, everything all across this farm says the same thing. You know that, right? He waits till I let him look me in the eye, let him look into me and all this fracturing. The seed breaks to give us the wheat. The soil breaks to give us the crop. The sky breaks to give us the rain. The wheat breaks to give us the bread. And the bread breaks to give us the feast. There was once even an alabaster jar that broke to give Jesus all the glory. He looks right through the cracks of me. He smells of the barn and the dirt and the sky, and he's carrying something of the maple trees at the edge of the woods, carrying old lights. He says it slowly like he means it. Never be afraid of being a broken thing. But we are afraid of being broken things. We are so afraid of it. And our fear of it makes us react to shield ourselves, to protect ourselves from anyone finding out. But God is not repulsed by our brokenness and will not wound us in our vulnerability. Brokenness can be how we are made whole. Again, from Anne Voskamp. Maybe you can live with a full and beautiful life in spite of the great and terrible moments that will happen right inside of you. Actually, maybe you get to become more abundant because of those moments. Maybe, I don't know how, but somehow, maybe our hearts are made to be broken, broken open, broken free. Maybe the deepest wounds birth deepest wisdom. We are made in the image of God, and wasn't God's heart made to be broken too? Wounds can be openings to the beauty in us, and our weaknesses can be a container for God's glory. Hannah tasted salty tears of infertility. Elijah howled for God to take his life. David asked his soul a thousand times why it was so downcast. God does great things through the greatly wounded. God sees the broken as the best, and he sees the best in the broken, and he calls the wounded to be world changers. Jesus is drawn to the broken with deep compassion. He himself was broken for the sake of abundance. And he can transform our brokenness the same way. God has been working with broken people from the beginning. In three generations now of this family of Abraham, we have seen great faithfulness and love and generosity. But we have also seen real devastating flaws and very troubled relationships. But God did not throw up God's hands in disgust with this family. God remained in relationship with them kept on loving them, and continued fulfilling the promises in and through them. And so we trust that our worst brokenness won't be rejected by God either. Instead, we can offer it up to Jesus to work with, to heal, and to repurpose. And that's not meant to be glib or to imply that it's somehow easy or to dismiss the real anguish and limitations and damage we may be carrying. But we can pray, and we can trust that God is as faithful to us as to the family of Abraham, and that blessing can come from brokenness, even ours. 
And maybe knowing that, we can be safe places for others to entrust their broken hearts as well. For we belong to a God whose deep love drew him to be broken himself, the body of the Son, the heart of the Father, so that our brokenness might not destroy us. May we trust and rest in that love and live with Jesus' own compassion for the broken world around us. Amen.